is not in this world, in its wisdom, or in its ways. Praise the Lord. We do have a higher ground in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as you all know, as Bible believers, everything we know about God comes from this book. And uh, any thought that you have about God that's correct has to line up with this book. And they thought you don't, if you have about God that doesn't line up with this book, well, it's not a correct thought. And a lot of people think they know God, but their thoughts are contrary to this book. And so again, this is one of the purposes of the King of the Mountain series, is just give little digestible topics, subjects. Most of it is things you already know, uh, but you can you know, go back and look at them. You can go back and refer someone to them. And uh, this afternoon, I want to look at a subject that I find fascinating. Um, I've covered it multiple times in little bits of sermons here and there, uh, but it's the Bible and science, and uh, the Bible is a scientific book. Uh, every time the Bible mentions anything about science, it's always true. Now, I understand, like, you know, um, you're not going to go find a chapter on biology, but the Bible talks about biology, right? And so... Uh, there's nothing wrong with science. We, we have a God that set this world in motion by his laws. The Bible just warns of science falsely so-called. <laughs> and there's a lot of science falsely so-called out there. Evolution, that's science falsely so-called. You know, the, the sad thing about evolution is even most scientists understand it's a fraud, it's a fake. And, you know, they, they've disproved evolution a long time ago, but they'll still teach it. And the reason is they want to go against this book. They, if they can overthrow Genesis 1, Genesis 2, you know, and God's creation, and then they can overthrow God. But this book has stood the test of time. The most brilliant minds, although atheists, go against this book, and they can never overthrow it. But I would encourage you to kind of write these down, maybe in the front of your Bible, or in the back of your Bible, or somewhere. I've actually used a lot of these facts on the streets, especially if you go to places like Ann Arbor where you have the educated at, and they start mocking or saying things, and it's just good in road. I'm not saying we want to appeal to their intellect. We appeal to the authority of the Word of God. But as you can show them some of these things, and they're, and they're just phenomenal how the Bible talked about them, so, and sometimes thousands of years prior to modern man knowing about them, and it just gives you the authority of the Word of God. So none of this is going to be deep. It's just going to be a rehearsal of many things that you've heard that I've talked about in the past, but I'm going to write them out give you the verses, and hopefully equip you f for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at this afternoon, science and the Bible. So the first thing, look, turn to Leviticus chapter 17, if you would, Leviticus chapter 17. And the first point, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about blood and the importance of blood. And, you know, 2022... This is not really a big deal, but it was a big deal for a long time in the world and even with modern science. Um, all the way up through the 19th century, scientists would think that harmful vapors would enter into the bloodstream, so the way they treated that was a procedure called bloodletting. And of course, we know about bloodletting because our first president, George Washington had what they say now was probably just a common cold, and they bloodled him to death. <laughs> they basically let so much blood out, he died. Uh, that was all in the name of science. <laughs> That's why you got to be careful about the name of science. Now, now listen to me. There, there's ditches on both sides. I'm thankful for scientists that are true scientists. And by the way, up until modern times, the vast majority of scientists were believers. They might not all have been our stripe. They might not all even been saved, but they recognized there was a God. It's just in the modern times where these scientists says there's no God. Do you realize every time they look under the microscope, they see the evidence of a creator? And the complexity of the Bible, the more they study the eye, the more they study the human you know, DNA and all that things, they see the fingerprint of God all over it, but they willfully deny it. But the facts are there. Uh, but up to the 19th century, they practiced this bloodletting. Again, George Washington, they bled to death. Uh, but all they needed was the Word of God. Again, I know very simple statement. I know you already know this, but this is a scientific fact. Yeah. Leviticus chapter 17, look if you would, in verse 11. The Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Again, we're focusing on the first part there, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. 
Now, I'm sure if you asked someone who studied like hematology and you know all the chemistry of the blood, there's a book out there called The Chemistry of Blood, they could expound on this statement a whole lot better than I could. Mm -hmm. Meaning how it carries oxygen throughout your body, how it carries nutrients throughout your body, how it carries white blood cells to attack viruses, and how it carries things, clotting agents in your body. You say, why? The life of the flesh is in the blood. Yeah. And God said that back in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Now, obviously, we also learn a doctrinal application here, and won't go too much into this, but that blood was made for atonement for their soul. Right all the way from Genesis, God required a substitutionary sacrifice. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, he had to make them coats of skin. And an animal had to die. You don't make coats of skin without killing an animal. And all the way through. And obviously what that pointed to was the truth that what flows through your body is the blood of Adam. And you have bad blood. So we needed a perfect Savior. We needed the Lamb of God without spot, without blemish, to show up to do what? To shed his blood. Because the life of the flesh is the blood. And because of that, the wages of sin is death. And we know mortality rate still 100%. You say, why? Because we have bad blood. <laughs> but that truth is found in the Bible. All right, let's look at another one. Sanitation process. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23. Uh, sanitation process. Some of these are kind of funny. Uh, but uh, obviously, if you don't do these things right, it's not funny. But uh, sanitation process. Make sure I spelled that right. And we'll look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 23. While well, I'm getting there myself, many of you heard and know about uh, the great cholera outbreak in London. In 1846, over 16,000 people died of cholera. And this is in London. This is not, you know, in the backside of a desert. I understand it's 1846, but this is still in London. But you know what they were still doing in London in 1846? They would relieve themselves. They would go to the bathroom, bathroom the restroom, in a bucket. And then they'd be in an apartment building, and they'd take that bucket, and they'd throw it out the window. And all that human waste would go into the streets. You still see that over in like third world countries, right? And they have a lot of death and disease and problems. Well, look what God said here in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look at, skip down to verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 12. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whether thou shalt go forth abroad. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back, and cover that which cometh from thee. Now, again, you look at that, it's like, well, why in the world the Lord put that in there? That you need to be in there. There's a very scientific reason that you should go outside the camp. Now, praise the Lord for modern plumbing, and but you know what happens when we ease ourselves? It goes outside the camp. You don't want that where you dwell. I promise you. So God instructed the children of Israel that they have a paddle with them, and they go outside the camp, dig a hole, go to the bathroom, and cover it up. Because he's the creator, and he understands sanitary practices. Again, that's Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verses 12 and 13 we just read. So just writing up here on the board. And so I'm thankful for modern sanitation practices. I've been overseas and where they don't practice it. And again, a lot of times, a lot of death and a lot of the disease could be prevented by if they followed the word of God. And uh, I don't remember exactly how this tied in. Maybe I'll get to it in a moment. But that's why the Jews were one of the people they blamed for the plague. You know, because everyone around the Jews were dying and getting sick, but not the Jews. You know why? The Jews practice sanitation practices, and, and we're going to talk about dead bodies and all that, what the Word of God instructed them to, even though they didn't know about microorganisms, and even though they didn't know, per se, about bacteria or streptococcus or whatever else there is out there. God knew, though, and he gave them very specific sanitation practices. All right, go to Leviticus chapter 19. That segues into this one here. And that's just in regards to germs in general. 
Now again, I'm thankful for modern medicine. I'm thankful for the telescope. I'm thankful for what they've learned. But you've got to understand, for the centuries, they didn't understand these things. They couldn't see these things that we can see today. And it's amazing the things that we can see today. Uh, I've told you also this before, but uh, let's see. don't have the exact year. Okay, 1847. Up into 1847. In modern cities, um, see if I got it mentioned again, it was somewhere over in Europe. But in 1847, the death rate of women delivering babies was 18%. That means one out of uh, every six children, the baby would die when they delivered. That's a high percentage. Ours is probably a little over 1%, maybe close to 2 in worst case scenario, but average, it might, he's shaking his head, no, it might even be lower, but uh, yeah, it's way lower. I know it's low, um, but uh, 18%, could you imagine that? I'd be worried if I was a woman gonna, or even a father going to go into hospital. I got one out of six chance my child's not going to make it. You say, why was that? Well, up in those times, what they would do is doctors often would conduct an autopsy on a dead body. And then they would go deliver a baby right afterwards. And what was standard practice during those days is if they washed their hands, they would dip them in basins and wash their hands. And then they'd touch this dead body, you know, cut it open, perform the autopsy, maybe wash their hands in a basin if they had time because it wasn't mandatory. And then they would go deliver a baby. And they couldn't figure out why there was an 18% death in the babies. Well, they implemented at this particular hospital hand washing, and this is where I got the number, it dropped to below 2% almost immediately once they implemented hand washing. Well, again, all they needed was the Word of God. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 19. Numbers chapter 19, I'll just read here, I have it in my notes. Uh, verse 11. Did I give that to you in 1911? All right. All right, and I, did, I said Leviticus is numbers. It's, there's probably something good in Leviticus too. You know what? I have two here. Let me see if this is right. This is the problem when you copy and paste because I don't want to read it wrong. Let's see here. Uh, it's not numbers? Numbers is right. Okay, all right, good. This is copy and paste. He that touches the body, is that dead body? All right, numbers 1911. He that touches the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. Verse 12. He shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But he, but if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Here's the whole point in Numbers 19. You touch a dead body, you are unclean. And they didn't understand that simple concept. That's why they would touch a dead body and then go deliver a baby. Now I want you to go to Leviticus. Have them both in here. Leviticus 15. And so we see clearly the Bible says if you touch a dead body, you're unclean. Leviticus chapter 15. Look at verse 13. Leviticus 15, 13. When he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue... Then he shall number to himself seven days for the cleansing and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in what? Running water. Running water and shall be clean. You see that? So not only did God instruct them, if you touch a dead body, you're unclean. He then tells them how to be clean. Wash your clothes, wash your body, but he says in running water. Again, one of the problems with this hospital was, it wasn't the fact that they weren't always washing their hands. And again, they didn't always wash their hands. Sometimes they washed it in a basin. Yeah. Well, what happens when you wash all those germs in a basin? They stay in the basin. Yeah. And so all you do is you spread it to the next person. But when you use running water, as God said, that's how you become clean. Yeah. So again, all you have to do is follow the word of God. And so that was Levit Leviticus 15, 13. And that should have been numbers. So we'll change that in a minute. Amen. So the Word of God always has the answers. And uh, I'm not the originator of the statement. I believe it. I, I think it's a good statement. But the world is always catching up to this book. And uh, I don't care if it's in regards to science, if it's in regards to politics, in regards to anything. The world's always catching up to this book. 
And God wrote these instructions long before we knew anything about them. I like this one. Go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Obviously very familiar story, familiar passage. And this is in regards to Noah and the ark. And, uh, you know, sometimes you read the Bible and God gives very specific details and you're like, oh, that's kind of a bore. Why did God tell me, you know, this many thatchets and this many, you know, cubits and all this? And But listen, as we know, the, the Bible, every word has purpose. Every word of God is inspired. It's given by inspiration. And so when God gives Noah these instructions, it wasn't so just like, you know, I'm kind of bored today, so I'm going to give you the details There's a purpose in these instructions when God gives Noah to building the ark. Look at Genesis chapter 6 and look at verse 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30, I'm sorry, 3 cubits, or no, 30, right? 30 cubits. And so what you have there is 300 by 50 by 30. And that was a very specific ratio. And what we learn there is about ship engineering. And God's detail in regards to ship engineering. And that ratio, which is basically 30 by 5 by 3, is the perfect ratio, listen, if you're going to transport cargo. It's not the perfect ratio for a warship to move fast through the water. But it is the perfect ratio if you're going to move cargo. (laughs) Well, what was Noah moving? He was moving the whole world. (laughs) He was moving a whole bunch of cargo. So a man in 1844, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Ismabard Brunnick, he built a ship called the Great Britain. He used that very ratio. You study the Great Britain, that famous ship, it uses the ratio of 30 by 5 by 3. And what they've done is they realize, as I just said, that ratio of the ship is the best ratio for cargo. In World War II, many of you know the Liberty ships. You know what the word Liberty ships were for? Cargo. To transport cargo as they move military stuff. Guess what ratio they used? Genesis chapter 6. That God gave Noah... In verse 15, there was a scientific study done in South Korea in 1993. They compared 12 different hulls of ship to the 1.5 million cubits foot of Noah's Ark. You know what they discovered? What I already told you. That ratio is the best ratio to move cargo. So they did it in World War II, even in 1993, South Korea studies this, and they came to the same conclusion. You know why? God knows the ratio of a ship, and he wants to keep all the cargo afloat. And again, so just think about that. You get some atheists, oh, the Bible is just an outdated book, and there's no truth in it. Give them some of these facts. What about Noah's directions in the ratio? What about germs and sanitation and life of the flesh and the blood? And these things can help you in your witness. But also I hope they build your confidence in the word of God. So it's not just this religious book. It's the very God, the creator of the universe, spoke all these things in existence. And when he gives these details that oftentimes we're bored by, we stop and pray and say, Lord, why did you put that in there? I know there's a reason. I don't understand, but there's a reason you put that in there. Let's talk about uh, oceanography. Look at Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. Again, I've used this one on the streets there in uh, Ann Arbor. Is the last time I checked or looked into it, the University of Michigan still uses his book at their university if you take any classes on oceanography. You say, why? Because he's known as the father of oceanography. He is the one who basically discovered the sea currents. He wrote about them and he published them and universities use them still today. You say, what inspired Matthew Murray? Well, the Bible inspired Matthew Murray. Psalms chapter 8, verse 8 says, The fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Matthew Murray is a believer. He passed in the seas. That little phrase there. Most of us look at it and say, no big deal. He said, no, there's paths in the seas. Where did he get it from? Your King James Bible. 
the word of God. Did you about this recently too? No, I'm just teasing. That's Sister Julie. But uh, anesthesiology, Genesis chapter 2. I'm all good with it. Let's do it. Let's get it done. They say, you got to be awake. Even put me to sleep for my wisdom teeth. That's how I am. I don't even want to be awake for that. And he slept. And he took, brought her unto the man. I know I've told you this, but man, it's just fascinating to me. Uh, um, Adam to sleep to take out a rib. And he said, man, God doesn't like just... He saw the effects of chloroform. And uh, Dr. James Simpson was the first physician in history before the Word of God. Because that's where he got it from. He read the Bibles from the Bible. So, obviously, Genesis 2.21. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. Isaiah chapter 40. I enjoy... uh, yeah, you know, just kind of looking at the stars and the sky and how beautiful it is and just the vast creation that God made. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about it. The Bible talks about the things that God's created. But one of the things that science didn't know for a long time that the Bible declared is the shape of the earth. And uh, sorry to disappoint any of the flat earthers. It's not flat. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40. Look what it says in verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that uh, stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And there's a whole lot to unpack in that statement. But I just want to simply show you that it's the circle of the earth. Now, again, I know those that believe in the flat earth will say it's a circle. It's just a disc and it's on a side. But anyways, uh, the point is the Bible said a long time ago that the earth was a circle. Well before they ever had a telescope and were able to look into the, in, you know, to the other planets. Well before there was a rocket that they could go out of space and look back on the earth. The Bible declared that it's a circle. Let's look at uh, another one. Let's talk about the stars for a moment. So we've seen the shape of the earth. Talk about the stars. Look at, if you would, in Jeremiah chapter 33. That's the last one is Isaiah 40. Verse 22, and this one, uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. And look, if you would, in verse 22. The Bible says, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. It wasn't too long ago that science taught there was only 1,100 stars. They really did that. They taught that. Now, it's been many years ago. But the Bible says they cannot be numbered. And you know what you see with the naked eye? You say, oh, man, there's a lot of stars there. And then it's a little bit clearer, and you're like, man, there's more stars there. And then the advancement of the telescope, you say, wow, look at how many stars there. And finally, you come to the conclusion the Bible's right. Man can't number them. And you can't. But you know what I'm glad? I'm glad we serve a God that can. So let's talk about man and his perspective. But the creator not only numbers them, the creator names them. Look at Psalms chapter 147, if you would. Psalms chapter 147. So the fact that they can't be numbered by us doesn't mean there's an infinite number of them. Man just simply can't number them. Psalms 147. And again, I'm sorry, I'm glad we serve a God that can. Amen. You know, it'd be a pretty sad God if he was limited by our ability. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad he's not. Amen. Psalms 147. Look what it says in verse 1. Praise ye, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcasts of it. Telleth. The number of them, he said, hey, there's Joe over there. <laughs> and they used to, from our perspective, limited. It tells us we see the shape of the earth, we see the stars. A couple more will be done. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. 
Now, again, you know all the mythology and all the what they used to teach in science. And I know I'm going back a ways, but they used to think the you know Earth sat on a big you know either giant held it up or sat on the back of a turtle or all different types of things. That's the wisdom of man, foolishness. You know, God said, "I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hang it on nothing, and hang it on nothing, it's going to go nowhere, and going from nowhere, it's going to come from nothing because I created it. I'm God." But that's what God does. He hangs it on nothing. You know, for the longest time, and this is a little dovetail, it's not about anyone else, but for the longest time, I kind of, when I taught the gap, I taught what I was taught, the basic concept that the earth was in the water, out of the water, and floated on the water, and after the Genesis gap, the fall, God plunged it underneath. I saw this verse and changed my whole teaching. I think God, from the beginning, hung it on nothing, just like he said. And if you ever see my models, Genesis 1-1 has the earth hung on nothing. I believe it always is hung on nothing. But that's the God we serve. He hangeth the earth on nothing. Here's another one. The book, you know the book of Job, they say is the oldest book in the Bible? But it's one of the most scientific books in the Bible. I mean, there are just fascinating facts in the book of Job. I'm not even going to cover all of them. But look at Job chapter 28. Talk about error for a moment. Job. Chapter 28. And if you would, look at verse 25. Job chapter 8, verse 25. The Bible says, To make the weight for the winds. And he weigheth the waters by measure. You know what you learn here? That wind, that air, has weight. And it was a long time that science always said, Air has no weight. But the Bible declared it does. And then as modern science advances, they said, oh, by the way, air has weight. Newsflash, Job already told you that. (laughs) You just have to read the book of Job and believe it. And so oftentimes there will be something like modern science will say, well, this can't be so. If the book says it's so, it's so. Modern science just doesn't know it yet. Don't worry, there'll be another oops. Well, now we know it's right because that's how it always happens. But air has weight. I like this one, same chapter. Job chapter 38, talk about light. Uh, It's the same chapter. It's in the same chapter. I'm all over the place. Job 38, sorry. I'm not very good at multitasking, writing, board, all that. But uh, do the best I can for the glory of God. All right, Job chapter 38, verse 19. Where is the way... You see that? Where light dwelleth. And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and thou shouldest know the pass to the house thereof. You know what the Bible declared long before science ever knew it? That light moves. It has a path. Light has a way. And of course, they start studying that out and came up with some amazing advances in science. But the Bible declared that light has a way. See, the Bible talked a long before COVID. Listen to me. That the sick should quarantine. Not the healthy. But the sick should quarantine. And the Bible talks about how they should be outside the camp. And obviously this is dealing with leprosy. Leviticus chapter 13. I know this is a side show. I might as well chase this rabbit. We're done. So how do you determine? I'll just tell you how I determine. If I go to work, I go to church. If I'm sick enough where I have to miss work, I probably will not come here because I don't miss work unless I'm sick, real sick. And so obviously do with that. That's free. You do with it as you want. But I never understand these Christians. Well, I'm sick today. Well, did you go to work today? You went and made money. (laughs) We're not worried about it. I promise you here. So that's just a rule of thumb I have. All right. So anyways, the point is from blood, sanitation, germ, ship, oceanography, anesthesiology, the shape of the earth, stars, Earth being hung on nothing, air having white weight, light moving, light waves, quarantine, and there's much more in the Bible. And that's why this 